Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Neck Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Basically today I'm going to talk about the cause of human disease. Primarily we're going to talk about the structural cause of human disease. Because of cell phones and computers, our neck curves are reversing because of the breakdown of the ligaments in the neck and that can cause not just body disease but brain disease. Now in science there's different principles so the main principle we're going to talk about today is Hauser's Law and Hauser's Law is when the etiology of symptoms and I'm talking about chronic symptoms. So when the etiology of chronic symptoms is elusive if you follow the neurology, the neurology will lead to ligamentous joint instability as the cause. So I'm going to go through different case scenarios of how you apply Hauser's Law to the etiology of a certain symptom or condition. If you have a symptom or condition that you apply Hauser's Law and you can't figure it out, please comment on that in the comment section of this video and I'll try to have me or my team figure it out for you and hopefully that's going to help you know the cause of your symptom or disease and lead to a treatment that's effective. Now one of the most common conditions that people have is sciatica. I've had sciatica. So sciatica is just where you have pain from the back and it goes down the leg. So the sciatic nerve is from the L4, L5, S1 nerve roots which stem from the back. So following Hauser's Law, what is the cause of sciatica? So if we look at the causes of sciatica just from a traditional medical science, you'd say, oh, herniated disc, degenerative disc, piriformis syndrome, spinal stenosis. Now obviously, when I see or Danielle sees sciatica, it's because traditional therapies like physical therapy, exercise, steroid shots, radio frequency, surgeries weren't effective. So following Hauser's Law, we would say, well, where does the sciatic nerve travel and what joints does that lead us to? So obviously we said that the sciatic nerve, the nerve roots stem from the lumbar spine, then the sciatic nerve has to go through the, or underneath the piriformis muscle. Well, where is the piriformis? It attaches to the sacroiliac joint here and it crosses the hip joint. So again, application of Hauser's Law, just for a simple condition such as sciatica, so a person has sciatica that's not resolved by other therapies, physical therapy, injections, manipulation, therapeutic exercise. So the sciatica etiology remains elusive. If you follow the neurology, like where does the sciatic nerve go, you'll see that the neurology leads to three different ligamentous joints instabilities. The hip joint, sacroiliac joint, lumbosacral spine. So if you figure out which joint instability is irritating the sciatic nerve itself and you treat those joint instabilities with prolotherapy, the sciatica should resolve. So then what would you do then to figure out whether it's the hip joint, sacroiliac joint, lumbosacral joint? Well, obviously you could do what? You could do stressor maneuvers or x-rays motion x-ray so this is basically my motion x-ray when I had sciatica and if you look at it that's in neutral flexion extension you'll see the key thing when I extended the L5 nerve root got compressed so I had instability at L5 S1 and when I received prolotherapy I actually had Danielle Matus treat me and she did a spectacular job treating me and you know now I run, bike, swim, play golf and have no sciatica whatsoever. So basically, okay, so somebody has sciatica, nobody can figure out the cause, then do you have clicking, popping, grinding in your lower back? Does, do you have pain around the sacroiliac joint? With hip motions, with hip motions, does your hip click, pop and 
grind. If it does, it's likely that you have uh, hip joint instability and it needs to be treated with prolotherapy. So again, treating either the SI joint, the hip joint, or the lumbosacral joints that should resolve the, uh, the uh, sciatica. So what about body diseases and uh, brain diseases? What about a person who has, uh, they've had a change in personality or they've had terrible head pressure or they have autoimmune disease? Like how do you apply Hauser's Law to those conditions? And remember, I'm talking about the structural cause of human disease. When we apply Hauser's Law, I'm not saying that it's the sole source of autoimmune diseases or personality changes or whatever. So when I have somebody with a serious condition, I'm thinking about five different causes of human diseases. So one is genetics. The most common genetic condition that I see at the Hauser Neck Center is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, where people are born, it's usually females, are born with very loose joints that sublux. So obviously genetics can cause human disease. What we eat can cause human disease. So I was the typical bachelor. I ate processed food. I thought uh, uh, mashed potatoes came in a box, you know. So when I met Marion, so obviously when I met Marion, who was a dietitian, uh, she taught me a lot about healthy eating. And uh, so obviously uh, in my refrigerator now is a lot of green things that I never had before. So obviously what we eat can cause human disease. One of the underestimated effects of human disease is what we think. We all know that if you continually complain, you continually are bitter, you continually are angry, you continually watch negative things on the news, like you're meditating on negative things, complaining things, that, that ultimately that's gonna cause you human disease. I'm just gonna give you a couple, well, I'll give you one case history. So one time at Caring Medical Illinois, I had three Amish people, in, well, I had five Amish people in the office, but three of them were here for medical care. So. The first Amish person, I walk in there and I'm like, you look terrible. Like, he looked terrible. I hadn't seen him for like five or six years. And I go, what's going on? And he's like, doc, I'm just telling you, in like 2007, no, 2008, 2009, I got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And so I asked him, I said, uh, did anything happen in 2007 or 2008, like a year or two before you got the rheumatoid arthritis? And he said, yeah, what happened was my brother and I's business, it was doing terrible. We were losing money hand over fist. I said, how often do you think about the money you're losing? And he said, continuously. You know, if you think about something negative continuously, you are gonna get some kind of disease. So if you have an autoimmune disease or systemic inflammation all over your body. Make sure that your thoughts are pure, wholesome, positive. So long story short, I had him look at his customers as appointments from God. And we talked about that, like the Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. So he changed his thinking to much more positive things, started praying for his customers, got to know his customers better, and his autoimmune disease got way, way better. Then one of the other patients who again had a similar condition, who was Amish in my office, and she was female, and I went in there and I said to her, I said, did one of your children leave the fold? And she goes, yes. And I, you know, like the Amish, sometimes when the children decide to not follow the Amish faith, the parents get really upset, especially the, uh, especially the uh, female, the mothers, you know. And I said to her, I said, let me ask you this. Is your son following the Lord? Like, they're, in other words, what you taught them, the Christian faith that you taught them, are they doing that out in the world? And she goes, yes. 
So I said, let me, let, let, let me try to understand this. So your son is honoring you by being out there like Jesus was out there, you know, trying to help a lot of people. And he's uh, following your faith, honoring you by following your faith. And he's trying to be a good witness in the world. And your belief is, the Christian belief is, that he's going to be with you forever because he believes in Jesus Christ as a Savior. Do you see where that's actually good? It's not actually bad? And I said to her, I said, he's a right brain person, isn't he? He's like King David or he's like Ross Hauser. Like, he loves color. He loves art. He loves all the things. And she goes, yep. And I said, it's just been my experience. Those are the children if they do leave the Amish. So I got her to think of it in a different way, in a good way. And again, her pains and her autoimmune disease and all the things got way, way better. So don't negate what you think. We, we have to make sure that what we're thinking is true and that our motivation of why we think that or say that is love. So obviously what we say can cause disease. Because what you say, you hear. So if you're complaining, you're complaining, and you're saying it, then you're hearing it. And the Bible says life and death is in the tongue. Life and death is in the tongue. So imagine if starting today, the only things you said or I said were positive, were uplifting, then you're hearing that, then you're encouraging other people, they're happier, they're more positive, they say positive things to you, well, obviously that's going to bring health to you. It doesn't mean that's going to cure disease, but you just can't complain and be angry every day and think like your, your health care condition is going to get better. Like we have people that come to the Hauser Next that are from all over the world and there's people with devastating life-threatening conditions. Like in the last several weeks, I've had a nine-year-old who's losing their vision. I've had you know, people where they have defibrillators placed in their heart because they, they almost died. Like all kinds of things from various ligamentous joint instabilities. And you wouldn't know it by their positivity, their courage, their hopefulness. So don't negate also what we do. That's where we get into structural uh, ligamentous instability. So somebody who for six or eight hours a day is looking down at a cell phone, right? So instead of the neck curve being like this, they're literally, you know, six hours a day, eight hours a day looking at the cell phone or they're addicted to the computer or the internet or they're playing games, video games. And once you get instability in your neck, it's going to affect human structure all down the kinetic chain. So dynamic structural medicine and Hauser's Law. Somebody has an unknown etiology of symptoms or disease, then you apply Hauser's Law. Hauser's Law for human disease normally leads to ligamentous cervical instability. And the ligamentous cervical instability causes th one of three things. Misalignment of the cervical vertebrae, especially the atlas. Uh, ligamentous cervical instability, and then cervical destructure means that there's a breakdown in the cervical curve. So once these things are discovered, then the treatment's going to be in an adjustment or proper posture or computer height with cervical misalignments. Cervical instability is treated with prolotherapy or in really, really severe cases, surgery. And then the breakdown of the cervical curve, of course, is going to be posture and various methods to do curve correction. We have to remember that the ganglion of the vagus nerve sits right in front of the atlas. So the DNA of the vagus nerve sits right in front of the atlas or C1. So if you have a breakdown of the cervical curve, that's going to keep causing vagal neuron cells to die. Once the vagal neuron cells die, the vagus nerve becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. The vagus nerve is how, it, basically, you need healthy vagus nerves to live because the vagus nerve stimulates repair, it stimulates digestion, it's how we experience love, laughter, lucidity, and it's how we enjoy leisure. So the vagus nerve is also called the nerve of rest and repair. 
So imagine a person who their vagus nerves are degenerated and they're in a state of constant stress. So if you're a person who just can't calm down, like I had a person yesterday and I was trying to explain to them that the vagus nerve, if you have degeneration of the vagus nerve, your pulse rate goes up and then the mother then explained that they saw another family member, so they had a device where they put it on each other and the daughter who I was seeing, her pulse rate, her baseline pulse rate was 20 or 30 beats above everybody else. So that's because the vagus nerve is what slows the heart rate down. And the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve sits right in front of the atlas. It runs from the brainstem all the way down into the inner organs and innervates the stomach, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the digestive tract, the lungs, the larynx, the pharynx, the inner ear, the, uh, the heart. And then the ganglion sits right in front of the atlas. So if you have upper cervical instability or you have breakdown of the cervical curve, then the vagus nerve is going to be affected. This is very complicated, but this explains the vagus nerve mechanisms of injury and, and the manifestation of it. And most vagal nerve injuries occur because of ligamentous cervical instability. So if you just follow this and you're like compression of the nodose ganglion of the vagus nerve, which leads to dysautonomia. So if you feel like you have dysautonomia, you have POTS, you have temperature dysregulation, you feel in a constant state of stress or anxiety, it's likely you have upper cervical instability. So the horrible progression of cervical destruction and cervical vagopathy, I don't call all vagus nerve injuries Hauser's disease, but as it relates to the cervical spine injuring the vagus, that's what I call cervical vagopathy or Hauser's disease. So cervical destructure, the progressive destruction of the supporting structures of the neck leads to disruption of the body's electrical grid and ultimately to human disease. So just in general, so applying Hauser's law, I feel nauseated all the time. I feel nauseated. So then you might say, well, is it the stomach? So I'm gonna, the stomach's innervated by the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve runs through the neck. So applying Hauser's law, you would say, well, it's probably ligamentous cervical instability. And cervical ligamentous instability causes a breakdown of the cervical curve, which eventually affects fluid flow into and out of the brain as well as the electricity through the vagus nerve. Say somebody says, I have rheumatoid arthritis, I have lupus, I have some other autoimmune disease. So I'm talking about if somebody worked on their, what they say, what they do, they change their diet, they, what they, what what they think. So say somebody has autoimmune disease and they become more positive, they eat very pristine diet, you know, vegetarian type diet, gluten-free, dairy-free, no artificial sweeteners, no artificial colors, because that's normally the diet for autoimmune disease in general, what people need to do then you know how much better did they get? And if they didn't get a lot better, then I'd say, well, maybe you got to apply Hauser's Law. So Hauser's Law would be is that if you have an immune problem and you look at what is the nerve supply, the main nerve that affects the immune system, you would say, well, it's the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve runs through the neck, so it's likely I have ligamentous cervical instability. So see where we have the vagus nerve, it innervates the enteric nervous system in the digestive tract. So when you have vagus nerve degeneration or impulses of the vagus nerve don't go to the digestive tract, you get increased intestinal permeability. That's called leaky gut. When you have leaky gut, you can get all kinds of autoimmune diseases. Hauser's Law applied to autoimmune diseases the cause of the autoimmune disease is unknown. Follow the neurology. The neurology leads to gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Those are, that's the immune system that surrounds the digestive tract. 
So 75 to 90% of the immune system is around the digestive tract because the easiest way for an invader to get into your body or my body is through what you eat, right? It can come through what you breathe or you could have a cut on your skin, but let's be honest, every day you're feeding your stuff. So the digestive tract is so important with the immune system. And then what's the nerve supply to the immune system? It's gonna be, or the digestive tract is the vagus nerve and sympathetic nerves. And those run through the cervical spine and thoracic spine. So somebody with autoimmune disease who says, oh my gosh, my neck crack clicks, pops. You gotta look at, do I have cervical vagopathy? And if I treat the cervical vagopathy with curve correction and prolotherapy, and my vagus nerve input to the digestive tract gets better, well, maybe some of my autoimmune markers will go down. What about a person who's been diagnosed with gastroparesis or they feel like food's just sitting in their stomach? Well, maybe the vagus nerve input to the stomach is hampered, right? So ligamentous cervical instability uh, can lead to vagus nerve compression, can lead to gastroparesis, can lead to nausea. So again, using Hauser's law, right, the cause of a digestive issue is unknown. If you follow the neurology of the stomach or the digestive tract, it leads to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve goes through the neck. So the cause of my unknown etiology of my digestive tract issues, irritable bowel, constipation, inflammatory bowel disease, digestive issues, leaky gut, SIBO, you follow the vagus nerve leads to ligamentous cervical instability. So if you treat the ligamentous cervical instability with curve correction and prolotherapy, then the symptoms typically get much better. Somebody has a heart arrhythmia, you know, they have a heart arrhythmia, or they have tachycardia, or they have POTS, or they have um, hypertension, you know, they have something related to the heart. Well, if you look at it here, see how the vagus nerve innervates the SA node, which is the pacemaker. So if you have a pacemaker problem with your heart, well, that's the vagus nerve. And if you have AV block, first degree heart block, second degree heart block, you have tachycardia, you're getting a lot of PVCs. Like I had a patient yesterday who we moved their neck in certain positions and they got like with a certain, I think it was flexion and lateral rotation. They had five PVCs in a row. Well, if you get too many prevent, premature ventricular uh, beats in a row, that can be a predecessor to ventricular tachycardia. So if you've had a echocardiogram and the cardiologist says the echocardiogram is, you know, it doesn't really show anything, then you got to, applying Hauser's law, you got to look at, well, it could be that if you follow the neurology of the heart, the neurology of the heart leads to vagus nerve issues, and the vagus nerve then again is ligamentous cervical instability. And you might say, well, is there a way I could tell that at home? So at home, what you do is you know, get one of the devices that monitors your heart rate, your, your EKG, like there's lots of things you can get on the internet, lo download an app, and then you just hold this certain neck position. So you hold a certain neck position and see if it induces, like I just told you our patient yesterday. So then you know it's front, like you hold a certain neck position and if you get you know, abnormal beats or your heart rate starts increasing, then you know it's related to your neck. This just kind of shows, like look at all the various headaches, look at all the various headaches that could be caused by ligamentous cervical instability. So if somebody had migraine headaches or cluster headaches and you research on the internet, what is the pathophysiology of headaches? You'd see that, oh, it's stimulation of the trigeminal nerve. Then you're like, okay, the trigeminal nerve what can affect the trigeminal nerve, then again, that leads to ligamentous cervical instability. Okay, so the jugular vein. Now, we all know the jugular vein, it runs, you know, the jugular vein is what drains the brain. So the jugular vein, it runs right along the anterior part of the neck, and it's very lateral, it's very lateral. 
So the only bone usually that can hit it is going to be the lateral mass of the atlas. Though if somebody has a styloid bone, which is an overgrowth of the stylomandibular or stylohyoid ligament, if somebody has an overgrowth of that, and there's other videos that I made on that, that can obstruct the uh, jugular vein. And then this is, oh, this is a really good illustration. See how the vagus nerve and the jugular vein, they can be compressed by the atlas. So the yellow here is the vagus nerve and the blue is the jugular vein. So if somebody has a condition that can be caused by compression of the jugular vein, like increased brain pressure, head pressure, migraine headaches, or the vagus nerve like we've been talking about, and applying Hauser's Law, it will lead to uh, upper cervical instability because of, usually it's either caused by a trauma to the head, like, a, like, a, like in sports, you know, like there's a head collision, or a car accident, or a too aggressive of a manipulation, or just simply looking down at a cell phone causing hours and hours of the slow stretching of ligaments in the upper cervical region. If we go to internal vein compression, internal jugular vein compression, there's lots of different things that cause internal jugular vein compression. The most common cause that we find in the office here is upper cervical instability from ligament damage. And internal jugular vein compression can cause intracranial hypertension. So anybody who feels that they have a brain condition, you know, like there's been a personality change, they, I, probably in the last week I've seen probably three people that have had derealization, depersonalization where they just don't feel like themselves, like they're in someone else's body. So if you've had a major change in your ability to think, your ability to problem solve, your personality, then using Hauser's Law would be like, well, the neurology of it is what? The brain. So then what ligamentous cervical, what ligamentous joint instability could, could affect the brain? Well, the most common one's gonna be ligamentous cervical instability because all the fluids and all the nerves that go into the brain or out of the brain have to travel through the neck. And because we live in 2023 and the average person is on the cell phone for five to eight hours a day, or in front, and you know, and if you think about if you have a job looking at a computer, I mean, you might be in front of a screen for half of your day. So we all have to make sure that our neck structure is good by making sure our computer setup is very, very high. And then this is what jugular vein compression looks like on a CT venogram. So this is supposed to be round. See how, it's, see how it's flat like a pancake? So this person has 75% of their jugular vein compressed at the atlas. And if your jugular vein gets compressed, there's parts of the brain that are more affected than other parts. Higher cognitive functioning, problem solving, high level brain activity involves the frontal lobe. And when you have intracranial hypertension or the fluid can't get out of the brain because the jugular vein is compressed, it really affects the frontal lobe. So that's what gives brain fog. Number one thing that I see in the office here, neck pain, headaches, one and two, and then number three is brain fog. So if you feel like you have unbelievable chronic fatigue and it's from your brain, you probably have intracranial hypertension, which we document by various tests that we do in the office here called neck vitals. And we check the how big or how small is the jugular vein in different positions. And ultimately that can cause compression of the eye leading to intraocular pressure being high or glaucoma. So if you have glaucoma and nobody can figure out the cause or you have blurry vision and nobody can figure out the cause, it's probably coming from your neck. And this is what jugular vein compression looks like under ultrasound, so see how big the jugular vein is there and how small it is there. So that's how we document it. Hauser's Law applied to brain diseases. When the etiology of symptoms is elusive, 
following the neurology, the neurology leads to ligamentous joint instability as the cause. So somebody has brain fog, cognitive decline, personality change, and the brain scans, the brain MRIs aren't remarkable. If you follow the neurology of proper brain function, it's going to lead to either there's a venous drainage issue or the blood supply to the brain isn't good or there's a vagus nerve issue because the vagus nerve, what tells the brain what's going on in the body is the vagus nerve. So if the arterial supply is decreased, the fluid can't normally get out of the brain because the jugular veins are compressed or the vagus nerve is degenerated, then of course the person's brain's not gonna function right, and all those three can be affected by ligamentous cervical instability. So ligamentous cervical instability induce changes in behavior, personality, and or psychopathy. So ligamentous cervical instability can cause vagus nerve dysautonomia, other dysautonomia because the sympathetic system is just too stimulated, internal jugular vein compression and vertebral artery compression. The internal jugular vein compression leads to increased brain pressure. So dysautonomia, vagus nerve neuropathy or Hauser's disease, cervical vagopathy and vertebral artery compression can affect the brain, which leads to changes in behavior, personality, and or psychopathy. I've had people who've had bipolar disease. We've We've uh, corrected their neck, uh, done prolotherapy, and they don't have bipolar anymore. And of course, I'm not saying all bipolar or schizophrenia or general as anxiety disorder, depression, that it's all related to the neck. I'm just talking about Hauser's Law applies to the structural cause of uh, those conditions. Like recently, I saw somebody who was sexually molested multiple, multiple times. Then they, and this is like many, many years ago, decades before. Then horrible marriage. Then, you know, then they got a condition, a very serious uh, movement disorder condition. And, you know, they did a lot of psychotherapy as they should, you know, uh, in, you know, try, you know, worked on their faith in God, you know, and then sometimes, even though there's these traumas, like obviously somebody who a condition started after a major emotional trauma, the treatment is embrolotherapy. You know, the treatment is obviously get help for that. But remember, I said when. You do all that stuff, like you change your diet, you change your thinking, you know, you work on your faith, and it doesn't go away. A application of Hauser's Law, like in this particular person's condition, would lead to a brain condition, which would lead to ligamentous cervical instability. So that's like the, the basis for it. This just explains how even vagus nerve issues can cause like all kinds of depression and brain inflammation and all kinds of things. Well, how would I know that if I apply Hauser's Law that it is gonna be the neck? Well, think about it. Somebody has, let's say somebody has uh, inflammatory bowel disease, right? And they were like, you know, I've had this for 20 years and about 20 years ago was when I first noticed my neck clicking, you know, like, you know, that would make one think of maybe there is a neck instability issue with it. So if you have a symptom or a disease and you don't know the etiology, but you're like, you know, I'm all hunched over and then I move my neck and there's clicking, popping and grinding, you at least got to consider that it could be ligamentous cervical instability. And this just explains like anxiety, like and we would all agree, man, there is just so much anxiety around it. I'm not saying all anxiety is from upper cervical instability. But if you are a calm person generally, and now you have anxiety, it's most likely something changed, like something changed in your structural anatomy. And 
the vagus nerve is what calms the body down. So if you have like an inability to calm the body down and you notice like my pulse rate normally is 60. So if all of a sudden my pulse rate was always 80, it's most likely going to be a vagus nerve issue. And then in the application of dynamic structural medicine, so looking at the cervical spine, one looks at alignment, you look at the curve, and then you look at ligamentous joint instability. And dynamic structural medicine is just how posture and movement affects the nervous system, the heart system, the GI system, the immune system, the endocrine system. So again, if somebody had systemic inflammation, first and foremost, you look at, you know, am I eating improperly? Do I have bad thinking? Or if I've worked on those things, then I might look at, well, maybe I have a structural issue. Do I have a misalignment? Do I have a joint destructure issue? Like I have a breakdown of the cervical curve. You know, and even the lumbar spine, it's supposed to be lordotic, cervical spine lordotic. So if it's reversed, what exercises, what can I do with my computer setup, raise my chest, uh, and if I got clicking, popping, grinding, do I need prolotherapy? So components of dynamic structural medicine in the treatment of symptoms and diseases. So somebody has a symptom, apply Hauser's Law, it goes to the neck where the ligamentous joint instability most likely is. Then do I have a misalignment? Do I have a breakdown of the curve? Do I have joint instability? So the way we would document those things is by an upright cone beam CT scan or digital motion x-ray. And then if there's a misalignment, we can do various ergonomic things with their computer, have them sleep in a certain way, chiropractic adjustments or osteopathic adjustments. If there is a change in the cervical curve where they lost the cervical lordosis or there's a change in one of the other curves, is there some exercise program that we can start to optimize those and if there's instability then utilize prolotherapy. The whole process in most people takes anywhere from six to eight months but boy we can see a lot of conditions and symptoms turn around.